Have your attention, please. Uh, I apologize for not having enough seats, but I guarantee this will be good. You'll enjoy standing. This will be a good presentation. Well, let me welcome you all to our second monthly science, technology, engineering, and math uh, lecture of our lecture series. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one for over a year. Before I introduce that for tonight, I want you to know that we have more coming up this year. November 6th is uh, technology and education, changing in education. And then we have healthcare, the science of beautiful music, um, screening the movie Switch, and, and a number of other things with science research groups. So a lot of things going on here. Very excited to see you all here tonight. We have two presentations actually tonight because we've had two major construction projects on the campus uh, over the past just about year now with both of those. And I want to introduce, first of all, the group will be going second, and uh, this is Sordoni Construction, who is doing our Kirby Center for the Creative Arts. If you'll stand, let me introduce the, the members here. First of all, Mr. Joe Galvin. Joe is the project manager for the Kirby Center for the Creative Arts. Uh, we have Stan Wykoski. Stan is the site superintendent. And we have Melissa James, who is the assistant project manager. And they will all make a presentation. And I'm going to have them go second, because first of a project we're already completed, let me introduce Mr. Bill Latwinski. Uh, Bill is the project manager for the renovation of Nesbitt Stadium. And as I tell people, Nesbitt Stadium was built in 1922 with a state-of-the-art facility in 1922. 90 years later, it was no longer a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, once again it is, once it is, and again it is, and I'd like to introduce Bill at this time, who is the project manager for Miracle Construction, and uh, he will tell us about the building of the, uh, or the renovating of Nesbitt Memorial Stadium. Bill? Thank you, Kim. I'm going to be purposely brief, and I'm going to kind of go quickly. Uh, I have a lot of pictures which are a lot more interesting than the words here, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to give some sense of what we did with Nesbitt Memorial Stadium and how what the process how the process relate to careers in, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, for reference, I'm a civil engineer, I'm a Penn State grad. So my my expertise is in civil, where this project touched on many different disciplines and areas of expertise. So once I get outside the civil, I'm gonna do my best, but don't get too technical with me. Um, STEM, the, the renovation of Nesbitt Stadium required the expertise of many professionals in numerous disciplines, all of whom use STEM skills every day in their career. On this project, the trades involved included landscape architecture, architecture, civil engineering, electrical engineering, structural engineering, plumbing, and HVAC. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. Um, the initial part of the project was, well, of any real project, whether it's the stadium or if you're building a new home or, or a renovation, of, is, is the conceptual project planning. When Miracle Construction got involved, there was already a, a conceptual plan for the stadium project already developed by the landscape architect, who, the firm name is Architera, who has a lot of projects completed around the campus. Uh, they had already developed a, a conceptual plan that, that's kind of shown here that we'll get to in a different slide. So in the conceptual planning process, our, our job was to then do a good survey for the project and stay somewhat high altitude, ask the big questions, understand what the needs of the owner are going to be, and then develop plans that are good enough that we can actually build what the owner wants. Uh, that was the conceptual plan that was developed by Arcaterra. If ever, I'm sure most of the people in the room have been by or been over at the facility, but it generally included uh, where, the, where the former facility had the old locker room facility and the bleachers. Every, it, recon, it, re it relocated all the uses to along Point Street, as shown here. <coughs> Uh, some old pictures of the old tennis courts. There's the old locker facilities. This was a site survey that we did initially, uh, which is done with land surveyors, which is typically a civil engineering trade. Some of the images of the, of the formerly existing facility here that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And I'm sure it was great in the 20s, but it certainly it needed a facelift. So. so after the, and again, I'm gonna go quickly, because I, I, I wanna have time for everyone's questions. Uh, after the conceptual planning process, you get into a higher level of design. Now, of course, whenever you're planning and doing that, the engineers and the architects are always interfacing with the owner to always kind of touch base and develop a design and go back and touch base and say, am I on track? Am I designing towards what you want? 
they watch budget, are we staying on budget, can we build this on schedule, all of those kinds of questions. As you get into a higher level of design, you start to develop things like floor plans, where you understand how many lockers you need for, say, the football team, and how many restrooms you may need in the public restroom for when there's an event, depending on the amount of seating that there is. We develop, these are hard to see, but uh, unfortunately, but, but these, are, these are floor plumbing plans and HVAC plans, uh, which of course is another part of the design with HVAC professionals so that the, the building is properly heated and properly cooled and there's proper plumbing. One, this plan is, is an electrical plan for electrical facilities within, within the building for lights and, and utility receptacles and things of that nature. But the plan behind it, this was a very particular and, and important plan for this project. It was the site lighting plan. As everyone knows, there's six tall light standards over around the field. Uh, two of them are 90 feet tall and four of them are about 60 feet tall. And when you're doing a project like this in a community where there's homes around the perimeter, it's a sensitive issue. If you live along the street that people may have complaints, you have to design the lighting very particularly so that the lighting is on the field, but hopefully not anywhere else so it's not disruptive to neighbors. So that was the plan that we had to develop and go through the Kingston Borough Planning Commission when we got the approval for the project. Here's some photographs of what was going on. Once you get through the conceptual design phase and you develop some construction plans, these are some pictures of the physical construction. This is a, an early rendering for the, the North Building, which if you go out there and stand on the field and look at it today, it looks very similar to this. Uh, architectural renderings like this are, very, are much easier to do today than they were even two years, five years, ten years ago. And they're a great tool to be able to sit in an office with someone that may not be technical and be able to show them what a project's going to look like. Uh, this is just some of the site under construction. This is the field over on this side. This is the south building, that's the north building, and then the bleachers are kind of sandwiched in between. Uh, another part of the design, aside from the buildings and the plaza and the paving and the utilities in the building, were the site amenities, which on a project like this was very important. The field, how the field works, it's an, art, it's an artificial turf surface, so it's, it's very particular in how it drains and how it's constructed. This is a site plan here that shows a couple of things. It's hard to see at this scale, but this is, this is Hoyt Street over here. This project has, everyone may not know, but it's got a long Skyler. It's got an underground stormwater management system. And the reason for that is that under current uh, land development codes in Kingston, we were required to detain the increase in surface runoff from this field. And the reason that there's an increase is even though it's green and the water goes through it, it's, 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 it's processed as if it's impervious surface from the regulatory community. So it's just, it's just the same as if it were a parking lot. So what we had to do is build an underground stormwater management system here that tied into the municipal stormwater systems out the streets. So you can see there's a pipe gallery of large diameter pipe, hundreds and hundreds of feet under this end of the field that discharges via infiltration into the ground. The reason that we know it works is because we went out and we did infiltration testing to the subsurface so we knew what the rate of infiltration was. There's also some other pictures here. They're hard to see, so I'm sure if you're not in the first couple of rows, you can't see them. But these are some pictures of the excavation when it was open for installation of the pipe gallery. And that's just another photo of the area while it was under construction. Uh, one function of, of, I guess, civil engineering that relates to this project, and really every project, is when you look at locating a building vertically so that when you generate the earthwork, when there's a cut and a fill, that you hopefully balance the site work so that you don't have to bring in a whole bunch of truckloads of material or take it off site because it relates into disruption to the neighbors, but it's also expensive. So this was a plan that we did when we, we surveyed and established what the topography of the field was. We developed a, a digital terrain model of what the finished grade of this field was going to be, and then we ran an earthwork by it. When we did that, we determined that we needed to lower the field so that we wouldn't have, so we would have a balanced condition. In accordance with that, we also had to do some different walls. We have a wall along below the, ble the bleachers, if you will, and then there's a small wall over here at, at uh, Pringle and Chestnut. And there's no wall, but there's a there's a there's a fairly steep, if you will, grade transition here. But the grades were a challenge on this on this site. Again, I'm going to go mm -hmm. fast. Um, here's some photographs during construction. Uh, this is the 
This is the location now of the support buildings here for everyone's reference. You can see that here's the, 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 bed, the, the railing from the old bleachers before we, we remove them. There's another site photo you can see in this one. It's much further along. The field is not yet graded or constructed, but the buildings are well underway. And this is a photograph that's a little bit further back. This is the area where the bleachers used to be, the former bleachers. This is the corner of, of Chestnut and Pringle looking towards the new support buildings with the bleachers in the center. And you can see in this photograph, there's no mud and dirt. This is actually the, the subgrade surface. This is the subbase surface below the field. So what you see there is a finished subgrade, and then you see about 10 inches of stone with a flat layer of, of, of drainage to get all of the drainage, all the water from the field from the rain event out to the stormwater management system. That's just another picture looking where we were standing in the last one. So the project tasks in general uh, would include that I think relate to, to STEM related type careers are the building programming, which in this project was really done by the landscape architect. That's where we got involved. And then conceptual building and site design, civil engineering and site design, architectural design for the building components, structural design, Structural for this job included both the building and there's retaining walls over on site. So the structural engineer would actually design those so that they, and design the drawings and the plans so that the contractors could build them appropriately. Uh, MEPS, which is short for mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and sprinkler design. Project management, which is essentially managing the process from the time that you get involved and you're dealing with the owner on designs, all the way through when you're finishing up the last thing, when you're touching up the paint and locking the doors and handing over the keys to the owner. That's a, that's a really significant role. They're, they're almost always technical positions, people that have a background in construction management or engineering. Uh, the physical, and, and then finally, the construction administration, which is the process of dealing with subcontractors, regulatory agencies, things like that. Um, I just want to zip around to a couple of <coughs> photographs for everybody's benefit. Um, some are better, some are not so great. Uh, this is a this is a photograph uh, in finished condition showing the, the padding on the, the four foot retaining wall between the upper plateau of the plaza where the bleachers are located down to the field. This is a pretty neat shot, a little bit closer to the to the uh, to the bleachers. That's another angle where you can actually see the logo in the field. Um, the field process was pretty interesting on this project. There, there's quite a number for people that, that don't know a lot about art, artificial turf fields. There's probably more qualified vendors for them than you would than, than might, you might intuitively think. Uh, we dealt with four or five credible vendors to select the field system that we did. It's made by a company by the name of Shaw, which makes probably most of the carpet in the country. You might have carpet in your home that's made by Shaw. Well, they made this field. That's an aerial view. The quality of it's not great, uh, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, this is a nice feature, I think, if, if you haven't been over there. The, there's, a, there's a fabric mural that wraps the back of the bleachers, uh, which is a really neat architectural feature that was designed in conjunction with, with the team here at Wyoming Seminary to include you know, some of their images and, and, and text. And I think it really dressed up the plaza and was really a nice, a nice added feature to the project. And that's just another view down the plaza. This is Wheat Street over here, and that's the back of the bleachers. So all in all, it was, it was a great project. Uh, we were thrilled to be involved with it. We knew it was a project that was very important to Wyoming Seminary, and, and we, were just, we were just thrilled to death to be involved with it. So that's, that's all I wanted to bring. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? I have a question. Sure. It's always fascinating to me. How do you get the field level? How do you make sure it's not sloping one way or the other? or? different levels. How do you get it perfectly flat? Uh, well, it is it is sloped. It's purposely sloped. Uh, it crowns from the center out at a very particular pitch. Um, the way that we do it is we, that we particularly do it, is we graded the field uh, with, with a grader and with a dozer that have GPS grade control systems in it. So actually, we in the office create, in AutoCAD, which is a drafting program, we create a digital terrain model of surface, like a video game. It goes onto a card, like a flash card from a camera. It actually goes out and we put it into the GPS unit on the machine that, that reads the surface. It's got antennas at the end of the blade that read off the satellites. The satellites tell the machine where it is on, on the field. And then the card in the machine tells it where to set the, where to set the blade. 
So it's, it's pretty slick. So in the it, old days, they'd be out hammering, and we still do it sometimes, but you, you'll hammer stakes and mark, you know, with paint on the ground, you know, minus three inches. You know, that those days are, are over, and this is much faster and much more accurate. So the, the operator of the vehicle doesn't have anything to do with moving the blades up and down. It's all done automatically. You can do automatic, but there's also there's just, there's a video screen in the in the cab that tells him to go up or to go down. <laughs> so it's it's pretty neat. Wow. Come on, am I going to have to ask all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So why do you, why do you take the field, you know, the ground uh, when there's so so good drains? I mean, they have all that water go right through. Um, I don't actually have an answer to that question. I know that the standard for design of fields is that they're, they're crowned and they're pitched. Um, I think that in, in the event that if it didn't, you would promote settling in the field, which they really don't want. Um, but on a synthetic turf field, which is very, it's, it's very particularly built, both the stone that goes on top of the subgrade below the field and the components of it are all tested to make sure they drain before the field surface goes on. So if it was flat, this field would drain. But you know, part of it, I guess I'm, I'm gonna answer my question, is probably so that the, the sub, when you develop subgrade, you put the, put the drainage on top of it, it's so that you can run your subdrainage with the grade. So you, you build your subgrade with a slope so that the pipes have a pitch to take the water. That, that would be good. I should have known that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So how do you determine how many pipes you need to get all the water that comes off the field. Uh, the, the herring, the, the field has, if you saw in this, in this plan here, it looked like a whole bunch of slanted lines all over the field. That's a design, it's called a herringbone piping pattern that comes actually, it's specified by the manufacturer of the field. And it's, it's, a, it's a one inch high by 12 inch wide flat drain. And it comes in a roll and it just rolls out on these angles. Every 20 feet there's a roll and it, it pitches by gravity. Those are sized to the spacing of the pipes determines how much area goes to it. So for a certain design storm in this region of Pennsylvania, you can calculate how much rain is going to hit the field. And then you calculate it into a volume, and then you calculate, you can calculate the capacity of the pipe based upon the size and the slope. But do you go by largest storm or, or average storm? You go by whatever whatever municipality you're in. They all everyone kind of has their own stormwater management requirements. I think for here we detained up to a 50-year storm. Um, which is a, like a 2% probability storm. It's not like a once every 50 year storm. But the state of Pennsylvania has criteria that, that talks about the duration of the storm, the rainfall intensity, the runoff coefficients. It's all standard. We, we, you know, as the design engineer, you don't make it up. There's standard criteria that you go by to design it in accordance with those criteria. So for this field, it was a 50 year storm. Sometimes they require a 100 year storm. Sometimes it's only a 25 year storm. Obviously, the, the higher the storm, the more precipitation. Those of us who live around here, as we know, that corner of, of Schuyler and Pringle, in a, before we put the field in, was a problem, right. drainage-wise, and they used to get a bit of water there. So the field had to take all that into account, and I, I wonder if it's not better now. We actually we're, fixed that problem. Is that right? We fixed it for the world. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They made it. Yes. The company you hired shop for the carpet. Yes. Did they do any major league uh, turfs? I'm you sure know. they have. I don't know that for a fact, but they're they're one of the largest in the country that do artificial turf surfaces. And if you, if you go on their website, they have they have a the list of all of the facilities. So I would be shocked if they're not. I think it would be a different surface than this. Um, the fields are all different depending whether it's a lacrosse field or field hockey or soccer or baseball or football. Indoor, outdoor, weather? <laughs> that I don't know. I mean, when they've talked about it, it's really sport related uh, because of the type of cleat they're going to use and, and the height of the, the blade of grass and what type of infill. Sometimes it's different percentages of rubber and sand. And those are all variables that the different companies have. Yes? So you saying that with that different sports have different turf? Does this turf change, or is it all the same turf? Like it's all the same. Okay. It's all the same on both fields. Okay. Yes. Wait, so that turf, um, how many sports does it like can it uh, have? Six, five. Grass, field hockey, soccer. Boys and girls, lacrosse, field hockey, soccer, baseball, softball, football. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no swimming. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's really a multi 
prototype of this field. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a lot. There's actually, there's markings on the field for all of those sports. If you go over and look, all the different colors. And that was a real challenge. That was, that was a real challenge of the process of getting the, the shot drawn approvable that showed all the stripes and the dots. There's dots for, is it for the the dots are for? I mean, there's, there's markings all over that field for all the different options of, of sporting events. Oh. Yes. Um, what do you use to print the logo on paper? Um, it's made out of, this is, it's, um, the, the fibers itself, it's, it's polypropylene, so it's really like a petroleum-based, like, plastic product. Um, actually, Shaw, the logo gets made in a, in, in, a, in a different factory, not by Shaw, but by a subcontractor that specializes in that. You actually send, we, we develop the artwork from artwork that Wyoming Seminary has for when they use logo and print materials and things like that. And we send them the logo, which is just typical, I think, the typical format for artwork you'd send to like a printer. And then they put it into their software and they make the logo, especially the subcontractor makes it all in one piece and they ship it here. And then they lay it out and they cut it into the field. So they lay all the green out and then they locate it, they cut it into the, into the green turf. Yes? Every color turf the same price, or are different colors like different prices? Like it's they're, they're different prices, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so the stadium before held one football field with bleachers on the side. Was yeah. it hard to make the room for the two fields going horizontally? That's a great question. Um, it was um, the, the conceptual design that was done by the landscape landscape architect first um, before we got involved. It was the same concept that we built today. But after we started and went out and did a physical survey of the field, we determined that between Hoyt and Pringle, it was actually seven feet narrower than he thought it was. So it was, it was we still, the, the field couldn't get any smaller, so we had to take it out of like the plaza and the bleacher area and make everything fit. But it was, that is a really, really tight layout to fit everything that's there. So it was actually pretty challenging to do. Do you have issues getting equipment there with it being in the middle of a city? <laughs> yes, that was that. Um, we we did. I mean, it wasn't it's it wasn't difficult to get them there. It was difficult to do it and not be disruptive to the neighbors. Okay. Because what I say to people is, if in your in, in your home, if you decided to paint the living room, <coughs> it would be disruptive for a week. Let alone if you rip out an old stadium and demolish it and bring all this heavy equipment in and rebuild it. The construction process by its very nature is disruptive. There's noise, there's dust, there's a lot of traffic that's not normally there. So um, you just try to be as sensitive as you can to that and to the neighbors and compress that time frame as much as possible so that uh, it's, you minimize your disruption. Yes? When the turf was brought in, was it brought in with multiple pieces and then you put it together like a puzzle or was it one piece you just like? Uh, it was. It was brought in in rolls, in, in like uh, about 15, 20, 20 foot wide rolls. Um, did you ever see like a, a carpet, like a roll of carpet? It's just a bigger roll, just like that. Um, they actually, when they make it, some of the lines that are on the field today, they actually make when they're making the carpet. So some of the lines were in it, and many of the lines were not. So they actually lay the carpet, and then they actually, they physically go out and with like utility knives, they cut the field and then sew in all of the different lines. Well, I see there are two courts. One is for football, and one is for soccer or lacrosse. So how do you make sure that people in the auditorium, another cheer stand, can see the soccer game? On the oh, far field? Yes. Um, I mean, why don't you just put in the middle of the court? The bleachers? The bleachers. Why don't you just put between the two courts? Right. I don't know that. Um, <laughs> I would think it's probably because it would, it would if you put it in the center of the field, it might be people might be more likely to run into them or, or, or have be more of a risk to, to be a barrier that you'd have to protect athletes from. <coughs> but I think that I, I think the, the design premise was such that the, the bleachers were really you could play whatever whatever event, whether it was a major soccer event or football or baseball for that matter, that you would have that you would have a crowd come to, but it can all be played on that field as close as to the bleachers. Just a, a, another <coughs> quick answer. We didn't believe there would be many situations where we'd have two actual contests going on at the same time on both fields. 
So we, we have kind of more the contest field than a practice field. Um, if we did have two contests going on on both fields at the same time, we have some small portable bleachers that we could uh, we could attempt to put in the middle or, or on the other side. But, but that's the reason. We would have lost space if we'd have put um, bleachers on both sides or bleachers in the middle um, yeah. that you would have had so half facing one way, half Well, and if you have bleachers, then you've got to get people to them. Uh, yeah, so that's it, right, it, too. It creates a lot of, and then if they're there, <coughs> they get to the restroom, so it's, it kind of becomes a compounding issue. Good question, though. Yes. Um, you know when you buy a, a wall-to-wall -wall carpet that after a few years you have to go ahead and have it restapled? <laughs> sure. <laughs> because it stretches. Yep. Is that a kind of a problem that you would have with the turf fields? Uh, I think it's uh, any any issue like that is a possibility. Uh, Wyoming Seminary and the people here uh, that are that are in charge of making the kind of decisions of who they wanted to go with and, and the kind of structure they wanted with them, they vetted the various companies very very closely. Every company that was that was being considered for a turf system here, uh, physically Wyoming Seminary personnel along with the landscape architect went and saw installed fields so they could physically see it with their own eyes and see how it behaved, talk to the people that in those school districts that operated to see if they had any problems. And what they also did is they had the foresight to negotiate into their contract with Shaw and extended warranty. Uh, so that if they have a problem, they pick up the phone and they say, you know, we have a game on Tuesday, you need to get back here and then we have a scene that's coming apart. Because that stuff does happen. Bill, I'm going to have to have to halt the questions now. He he told me we'd stay around afterwards, and someone would like to ask more questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, take about a three-minute stretch break in place if you want to stand up, and we'll switch the. Uh, I guess we should have done a switch instead of standing. Hey, once again, I'd like to introduce the project management team for the Kirby Center for the Creative Arts from the Sardoni Construction Company. We're very happy to have them with us. We just been doing a great job, and, uh, and we get to see it close at hand every day, and I get excited all the time. Joe, I'll turn it over to Joe Galvin. Again, my name is Joe Galvin. Uh, I'm the project manager for Sardoni Construction Services. I am only one person and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of team players um, that has the opportunity to work on this project that was going for you guys. Um, my partner in crimes right now, and again as Kip has mentioned, is uh, Melissa James, who's the assistant project manager, and Stan Wachowski, who is the on-site uh, field superintendent on the project. Uh, all he's there all day. So, um, a little bit about this presentation. I know we don't have that much time, but in this little bit of time, we're gonna try to walk, all three of us are gonna try to walk through the whole process of what it takes to build this building. And as you walk out on that street at different times during over the next year, um, I want you to take a look at it, stop for a few seconds, and kind of just remember the presentation and Think about how many hands are touching all aspects of the project. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do. Now a little bit about me. I am, um, I'm a, I have a graduate, de I have a degree in structural engineering and construction management from Penn State University. I, um, I'm local to the area. You know, I was born and raised in northeastern Pennsylvania. So getting into and being part of this project or doing any kind of project for any owner that I've done, um, I can tell you this, I'm always going to come back to Kingston and going to come back here on Hoyt Street and, and take a look at this project just to see how it's going because it's one of those things that um, I personally personally get involved in. I think um, the team members actually as they come up and introduce them what they do, um, they're going to pretty much say the same thing. So the first, first aspect, um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Melissa. And she's going to start talking a little bit about the architecture. So my name is Melissa James. I'm originally from the United Kingdom. Um, I came out here about 10 years ago, but my background in education is in interior architecture. Um, I have a bachelor's 
Bachelor's of Science. Um, my, um, my professional career has stemmed for about 10 years. Um, I work for a local firm in Wilkesbury, a local architect, and there I was a project manager. Um, I came to Sidoni about a year ago. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the process from an architectural perspective. So any, any foundation of any design begins with a concept or an idea. And the idea or the concept has to begin with the end user, which is Wyoming Seminary. Um, Wyoming Seminary came up with the idea, of they, they went through the process of a feasibility study and evaluated the buildings that they had on site and saw that there was a need for another performing arts center. And somewhere that, you know, that we can have rehearsal rooms and um, those type of uh, auxiliary spaces. The next point is to go to an architect and to discuss the design elements. The architect then begins to do a programming uh, study. Uh, they'll meet with Wyoming Seminary and user groups. Um, they'll come up with the square footages. They'll come up with the needs and the, ne the necessities. From there on, you begin design development, floor plans, interior elevations, space planning. And we'll go back and forth um, <coughs> with the spaces to see what's needed. From there on, you'll begin to do construction documents. And at that point, you begin to get more detailed. Here we have a floor plan, and it's the first floor plan of the actual performing arts center. Um, you can't see the details that well, but from an architectural perspective, you start adding uh, tags, in, um, wall sections, dimensions. Um, it's very, it gets very construction oriented. The next shot is going to be the exterior elevations and we'll, we'll draw up the four sides of the building. We'll cut sections through the building and that'll get us to wall sections. This is if you take a slice of the wall um, so you'll start to see actual details, starting from the foundation, working your way up the walls, and you can see the brick, and the, the metal studs, all the way up to the parapet of the roof. The next process in this is typically you'll go to the local municipality or the borough, and you'll submit the plans and the elevations, all the construction documents, to the um, officer or the construction planner. Um, they'll review actual drawings and then we'll go through the permit process and we'll receive the building permit. So these are just a little, um, some interior shots of the performing arts center. Um, and a part of my job when I used to work at the architectural firm was to uh, select the interior finishes. So we'll go through everything from carpeting to seating to wall finishes. And this just gives you a snapshot of those elements. And again, this is the gallery in the front of the building. The construction process. <coughs> from, from the architecture, um, from the, when the architecture actually gets done, this is primarily where then the owner will get involved, a, a construction manager or a construction firm involved into the project. And and sort of that's where my job comes comes into uh, or in, into a vision um, of project management. And I say, well, project management, it, it really essentially is wearing a lot of different hats. Um, we, uh, we're problem solvers, we're negotiators, we're estimators, we're um, schedulers. Put all that in, into one hat and vary us during the process. And it starts right after we receive the construction documents. Um, first of all, during the, the, actually during the design stage, usually the owner will get us involved and we'll produce a budget. Basically, at some point, 80% of the documents that will get done, the owner will get us um, involved and we'll tear apart the documents and we'll start putting together a budget. 
which means that you take out the site work, you take out the structural, and you start taking all the components of the project out, and you put price tags on each of them. And next thing you know, you start developing an overall budget that the owner can look, you know, look at and decide whether or not, you know, the project, you know, is fits for them. Whether they can spend a little bit more if it comes under, or they have to cut back. And really, when, when you're doing come back, and I'll just jump to it, you know, as a value engineering um, right here. Usually, if there's, uh, if we come into the budget and it's a little bit of a higher price, you know, the, the, the techno term is value engineering. Really, what that is, is looking at different ways um, to give the owner the same quality of the project, but maybe you can use a different, you can substitute a different material that's a little bit less expensive, where you can make the room a little bit smaller. There's different things you can do that provides value, but yet don't substitute on quality or what exactly um, the owner's end use is going to be. During the process of pre-construction, it is really, you know, it is the time frame from, from the drawings to where we start construction. And in that time frame, again, once the budget is established, we also, um, back at the office, we have a team of estimators that will take the drawings and then they will um, put sets out and they will go to the community and they'll get a list, they'll, they'll, they'll solicit trade contractors, um, there'll be structural steel, there'll be site contractors, that'll basically, they'll have a time frame of four to six weeks to put a price together. And then all those prices come in on one date. It's a very critical date while it's bid date. 2 o'clock p.m., all the prices have to be in. They all come in, we put them in all spreadsheets um, we, from lowest to highest, and, and, uh, and we take a look at that. We usually, at that point, share that information with the owner. If, uh, and then we compare that with the original construction budget that was established a month or two ahead of, ahead of time. After that, then we, you know, if it's a go, we we'll sit down with the first and second low bidders and we'll go through their scope of works to make sure that they have the right price and we're not missing anything. And then that's when the, the low, most responsible bidder then is selected for the project. We write contracts and, um, and we actually get started. Also, um, part of the pre-construction phase is we develop a construction schedule. Again, in this process, you tear apart the building again. You, you look at the different aspects of the project, the site work, the concrete. You start putting timelines onto how long it's going to take to put the, the concrete foundation, how long is it going to take to put um, the structural steel up, how long is it going to take to put the exterior walls up, the veneer, the brick. We start developing that schedule. Now this is just one page of a probably a six or seven page schedule all the way to the end. And usually that end date is known by us um, early on. For this particular project, the end date for us is gonna be early June of uh, next uh, 2014. And then we'll work with Wyoming SEM to move in during the months of June and July so that the building is up and running um, for first day, you know, in a sense for that fall semester of getting started. Um, just to get, just before we actually get started on the construction site, we also have to take a look at um, the logistics of the project. Here is, this is the new facility. This is the, you know, the plot of land that, that was uh, cleared off for the project. And we set up our little plan, basically, again, knowing the fact that we have neighbors um, that we have to live with, that this is a, you know, this is a, this is a school, and so we've got to basically protect the limits of the construction site. We have to know how we're getting into the project, how we're going to move around it, where we're going to store material, where we're going to set up the crane to erect it. All this is all pre-planned. Um, in a sense in that stage. So when we know that we're gonna start on day one, um, we, everybody on the whole project team knows exactly where they're, where they're at. And now, 
It's day one. Stan. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is a, what we'll call the fun part of the project. I know the stuff that these guys do is real, real important to get the project started off. But now, it's the fun stuff. It's the nuts and bolts. It's the putting it together. Okay? It's uh, everything that we do to get this building up for you guys in this timely fashion so you can enjoy it and understand it. This is uh, the first thing we're going to talk about when we start at the site. Before this project started, of course, there was a couple houses on the site that they needed to be moved. The first thing that happened was the relocation of the rudder house to Maple Street on the other side. We picked the house up, jacked it up, put it on these rollers on the bottom, okay? rolled it over to the other side, and put up a foundation, set that house back down. And somebody's living in there. I think there's a, uh, there's a professor that's going in that house. It was one of the things we had to do uh, prior to starting this project. I'm going to talk a little bit about survey and layout and the sequencing of this whole project. The survey and the layout, when you first start a project, you have to come in, do some demolition. Of course, we knock down this uh, apartment complex. Next slide. We come into the site. Okay, we clear the site of all vegetation. You can see there that they have a, a roller there. They do what they do is proof roll the site to pretty much seal the top of the site, okay, so we don't have in a rainstorm, it doesn't soak into the ground and make it all muddy, okay. The next slide there is excavation for footers. You can see as we excavate for the footers, the excavations get benched back, okay, which is an OSHA requirement, so you want to clean in or if the soils are loose, okay. Um, the next slide is starting of the formwork for the column footers and running footers, okay. In this slide, you can see we put Put our formwork in. It's hard to see a little bit. There's rebar in there. Um, one of the requirements that we had here was if we opened up for a footer and we were going to have a rain event or something that was going to happen, we had to put down what they call a mud mat. We had to over excavate three inches, bring in what they call a lean mixture of concrete, which is a pre gravel, low strength concrete, and cover the bottom of the, the base of the ditch with that. So if it does rain, that that bottom doesn't become muddy and sloppy and messy because it's a real important part of your foundation. You've got to build a strong, good foundation before you can start. Uh, a little bit more here as the footers went in. You can see the rebar sticking up for the walls, for the foundation walls, the offsets. Now, in this picture here, we have walls that are poured. This is the back corner, um, back by the maintenance building, the back of the building. Down the front of the building, this is the front. You can see the curve. If, when you guys are going by the building, you can see in the front, the way that, that the building has that arc in the front, is all going to be glass in the front. This is the foundation for there. Just some more shots of uh, foundations. This, uh, that's the elevator shaft there that we poured before. We laid the block up for the shaft before we erected any of the building. Uh, our crews installing slab on grade. You can see the in, in that composition there, we put down a vapor barrier. It's a 15 mil plastic vapor barrier that all gets, all the seams are taped, sealed to all penetrations. Uh, the welded wire fabric goes in, and of course we pour the concrete. Okay, concrete placement, all right, concrete finishing. And this is a one day, you know, a one day process of the placement of the finish. Um, this is the auditorium floor, or looking out into the auditorium from, from the stage, from stage left. Okay, this is, is the orchestra pit. For those of you who are in the band and might play in this orchestra pit. This is the beginning of the pours of the sloped floor from stage left, looking up out of the orchestra pit, the lower level, and then the slope going up to the ceiling. And this is the continuation of that floor. This is delivery of steel. I can't see the, the little small thing myself, but uh, delivery of the steel. This is the beginning of the direction of the columns going up. Okay, setting steel and tying everything together. The balcony steel started there. Our second floor steel roof steel going together. This is the proscenium in front of the stage, uh, both sides. This is the second floor slab on deck, as you can see. The decking is down. There's two layers of woven wire fabric in there. You can see 
sit on chairs, they call them, to keep the space between them, we pour the concrete. More pictures of, of steel erection. The setting of the cupola. And this is uh, the dedication view and a couple pictures here. As you can see, we're starting to close in the building. On the west side, the sheeting is going on at purple board. Here's the exterior sheeting. And, uh, a little bit of things that happen on site. Problems. Everybody has problems. Problems come about, whether it's a drawing error or it's a little glitch. That, you know, my component doesn't fit with yours. How are we going to work that out? Uh, we have a couple little things that happen here. One is RFIs, request for information, which we get from our subcontractors. If they have a drawing issue or they have a question, uh, an RFI comes into my office, it's forwarded to Melissa, and then she'll process that and send it out uh, to the architects, which goes to the engineers for an answer, and then what happens? Then the architects can answer the question, what's the solution? Um, depending on what the drawings show, uh, they might come up with a sketch a different solution to what's already been proposed. So then they'll send that solution back to us and we have to distribute it to the subcontractors in the field to make sure that everybody's basically on the same page. Next is submittals. Submittals are all the materials, uh, the equipment, anything that a subcontractor is going to purchase for this project. It goes through what they call a submittal process. If it's uh, carpet or it's tile or it's paint or steel, Everything has a shop drawing that's attached to it, which comes to us for a review, goes to the architects and engineers for review, and all the submittals uh, or the products are all developed in what they call project specifications. So they know what they're going to put in. This is like a check that they're buying the right product, it's going to the architect and engineer for review, comes back approved or denied sometimes if they try to substitute something. Sometimes that happens. Um, just to make sure that everything, it's just the checks and balances. Um, anything I'm submitting? I'm drawing out the process, it's a long process. Yeah, it could be shop drawings, so it could be steel, so the actual layout of the steel. It could be mill work, so it could be sections of cabinets, kitchen cabinets. Um, and as Stan said, it ranges anything from carpet to the actual adhesive that puts the carpet down. Everything gets submitted and approved to make sure everything's right. And of course, there's field conditions. There's always those little niches. You know, this, this cabinet is going to go here, and this door is just a little too close. And those are the things we solve every day. Every every contractor always has a question issue or I call them two systems. Questions, comments, and concerns. Uh, continuing milestones for this project, we're only going to take you to the point that we're at now. We're not going to progress all the way to the end, just want you to understand what you see so far. One thing, an uh, important thing in uh, today's elements with buildings is the building envelope, which is the exterior of the building which includes the roof, which is the PDM rubber roof, and that roof wraps around the top of the parapet, which is the top of the wall, and connects to what they call an air vapor barrier. It's the stuff that's going on in the building now. It looks like a blue sheet that they're putting on there. What that does is it keeps any kind of moisture from transferring from the outside to the inside with the R values and all of that stuff. It's a very important thing these days in keeping buildings energy efficient and dry and no moisture problems. The next thing that's going to happen on your project here is going to be the roof is going to be going on in the next two weeks, uh, which is a rubber roof with insulation. Okay? We're working on interior work, starting to frame the rooms, the corridors, the metal stud work, okay, which starts to define all the spaces and leads us uh, to the next phase, which would be the rough ends of plumbing, electrical, mechanical, okay, which are the MEP systems. Well, Joe wants to talk about the beam that everybody saw. <laughs> Actually, you know, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly, but. Um, I do hope that everybody had a chance to, to, to sign that beam out there because, again, you personalize that building out there for the rest of your life and your career, and um, as wherever that may take you. And every time you're going to come back, 
um, that little piece, you're going to know you wrote your name um, up on that, on that beam in that structure. So, I'm, as coming from a structural background myself, um, you know, educated as a structural engineer, I like the beams. I, I was always fascinated with beam design and the moment connections and that. So that's why I just wanted to get a little bit of detail, you know, um, with, with you guys this evening just to kind of go over. First of all, this is the structural drawing that has come to us as part of the design package. And um, what you see here, this is the beam that's, that, we, that was elected to be the last, last, last beam to be erected. Um, so we signal it out. The, during that process, the shop drawing process that um, Melissa and Stan talked about a minute ago, this is their erection drawing. So they take the drawing, the structural drawings, and then they have to actually go through design and double check all the connections and make sure that the beam is, uh, is adequate. So they go through it and they create the drawing. And again, what's highlighted in red is the beam um, the, in question. This is actually the shop drawing of the beam, and it's a, I believe it's a W24 by 55. And what that stems to is a 24, 14, actually it's 14 by 55. It's 14 inches deep, and it weighs 55 pounds per lineal foot of beam. So that's just a little uh, tech, you know, a um, little bit of engineering about the beam that you guys uh, actually signed. And just real briefly, I'll try to run through these. Um, you know, the beam comes in from the mill factory, goes to the site ready to be uh, put into the shop. These are a lot of the little plates that are designed and punched out and, and cut in the fabrication shop that ultimately will get attached to the beam itself. This is the beam on the beam line. Actually, this is where they, they actually get started inside. Um, and actually, this was all done locally by a local um, by a local structural steel company. Um, this is this is their shop, and this is the beam inside inside the shop getting fabricated. Um, part of that fabrication is a drill press. Everything is all computer aided drawing. So the drawings that are done in shop drawings actually communicate to these machines out there. And where it says that they need a hole, it lines up properly and it drills those four holes for those connections. So again, the importance of processing through, uh, through the design, architectural and structural phase to the steel, it, it goes right into the machine that's actually gonna drill the holes. And it is, these days, it's uh, that exact. Then this is just a gentleman hand um, tightening up part of those connections that you saw there and attaching it to the beam. Um, and then this is actually the beam being done. He's cleaning it out into the shop. And this, this actually, yeah, this is for the lights. What's that? For the lights. Uh, this is actually the steel topping off ceremony, and uh, I'm sure many many of you uh, were there. This is the beam that um, now is you know arrived on site. Everybody signed, and uh, and it's currently being erected. And again, um, over and over again. <laughs> I guess overall, in, in closing, um, you know, there is so many people that are involved in this whole uh, uh, you know, design and construction process, and uh, and really, it, it's I, I've had a lot of fun doing what I do in my career. I built a lot of different types of structures. I've been very, very lucky. But I think from your standpoint, again. Your takeaway is, you know, look at look at, in, um, at the building, personalizing it now, and, um, and and being able to enjoy that facility once it's done, but understanding what it takes to actually uh, put a structure like this uh, together. And this is kind of a very short, for, you know, very short description on a very uh, long and, and, and involved process. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, you know, do you have any any questions for the three of us? We have time for about one question. Then we're going to let people go who've got to be out of here at eight o'clock. 
they promise to stay around here for others who may have questions. I, ha I have at least a couple. Um, if they do it. Uh, Joe, Melissa, and Stan, thank you all very much. For that. Okay, me, do I get to ask you? <laughs> Why did you build the, uh, the elevator shaft in, in, you know, right away and kind of leave that there on the thing and not build anything else? Well, in the whole process here, of, um, in the construction schedule that Joe talked about in the beginning, you know, we put, we develop a schedule and it comes together and we had a little small problem in the beginning with the steel. So it took a little bit of time for us to develop this, this shop drawings for the steel and go through the approval process to start the fabrication of the steel. So we accelerated <coughs> items in the schedule. One was that we can do we need to put the elevator shaft in. Since the footing and the foundation for the elevator pit is part of the, is part of the foundation system, it's pretty much self-supporting. We were able to lay that block up and just get that portion of the work out of the way. And also in the rest of this, I mean, to elaborate a little more on that, we poured all of our slab on grades and all of our floor slabs, which we normally wouldn't do in that process. We would put the footage foundations in and right behind it, the steel would come. There was a little bit, like I said, problem in the cement process, which slowed us down, so we accelerated other parts of the project to make sure we complete on time. I thought maybe it was a calibration device or something to provide you with some spot to, to mark it. But with that, I will let everybody who goes need to be out here at 8 o'clock. Thank you all for coming tonight. Don't forget about